All right. Jumping in. So first of all, thank you so much for being here. I'm super stoked to be here. Uh, my name is Marcus Collins, and uh, there's so much for me to talk about. But today, I figured I want to focus on one thing in particular. And to do this, I would like to have a family meeting. Right, and call it an intervention, if you will. I want to get us all together, gather on the couch, and let's have a very candid conversation. And that conversation is going to be about data, data, right? And, and here, here's the thing: when, when we think about data, right, we have more data than ever before, right? One even said that in 2011, we've generated more data than mankind has since the beginning of history, since the beginning of time. But here is the paradoxical uh, scenario. We have more data than ever, reams and reams and reams and reams and reams and reams of data, but our ability to extract insight from data has only increased marginally. It's a paradox. More data than ever before, but we've only been able to, to generate just a marginal amount of insights over a period of time. I mean, with all this data, markers are still wondering uh, struggling to figure out what's going on with their consumers. They're struggling to understand their consumers. How can this be? How is this reality? Well, my friends, that sets the stage for what I'll talk to you about today. A new perspective, a calibrated perspective on data and this data paradox that we are experiencing. So the first we need to start, let's just start by first defining what exactly is data. I, I like this definition of data. data is the things known or assumed as facts, the representation of what is, an, an observation of what is, the representation of reality. With that in mind, as we think about calibrating our perspective on data, the things that are known or assumed as fact, there's three things that we have to think about. And here's the first. The first is that not, not all data are created equal. Data being the plural of datum, which is singular information point, not all data are created equal. And there's two really kind of big bucketed forms of data. There's self-reported data and empirical data, right? And the first is self-reported, right? So self-reported data is the measure that we use when we ask people to directly report on their behaviors, their beliefs, their attitudes, and their intentions. We ask people to self-report, and we do that by many different forms through interviews, questionnaires, surveys, and focus groups, right? We ask people to report on how they feel. We ask people to report on what they've done. We ask people to report on how they cognate. But here's the thing with self-reported data. Self-reported data by itself kind of sucks. It kind of sucks, y'all. I know people are like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Marcus. I use self-reported data all the time, and it's been very helpful for me. Probably, but I tell you this, it kind of sucks. And here's why. The first is that people are liars, flat out liars. People lie. Now, are people bad people because they're lying? No, not necessarily, right? Even I lie. Like, we, we're bad. We, we, we lie all the time when we're asked to self-report. For instance, pre-COVID, I went to the dentist. And the dentist asked me, uh, Dr. Collins, do, do, do you grind your teeth? And I go, uh, no. And she says, uh, are you sure you don't grind your teeth, like maybe at night in your sleep? And I go, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I know if I grind my teeth or not. I don't grind my teeth. And she says, well, that's interesting because your x-rays say otherwise. And I go, oh, I, I didn't even realize that. Oh, and of course, that evening I went to bed and... I actually could feel myself grinding my teeth. So my wife the next morning was like, I'm a liar, right? Am I purposefully trying to lie? No, right? But these are things that are happening that I'm not aware of. They're happening in my behavior that I'm not aware of. So when I'm asked to self-report on that behavior, it's not a representation of truth. It's not good data. And we, we rely on this self-reported data all the time, despite the fact that it's not as truthful as we want it to be. Take the general social survey. This is a survey uh, that's used self-reported panels. We ask people to self-cognate, right, to report on their cognitions. And we use that information to inform 
policies, to inform marketing strategies, to inform uh, research that academics use. And that's self-reported data, while voluminous, while we have a ton of them, are not very helpful. Case, case in point. So the, 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 the general study survey asked women in cisgendered heterosexual uh, relationships here in the States. And they said, how often do you engage in heterosexual activity? And women over the age of 18 said, well, you know, 1.3 times per week. And we use a condom 20% of the time. So just doing the math based on the population that should equate to 1.1 billion condoms sold per year in the United States. When he asked men of the same demographic makeup, men reported 1.5 times per year, per, per week they, they engage in sexual activity, heterosexual uh, activity. They use a condom 20% of the time, which by math should equate to 1.6 billion condoms sold in the United States per year. But according to Nielsen, only 600,000 condoms are sold each year in the United States. Somebody's lying. Somebody is not telling the truth. Of course not. We're just not that good when it comes to self-reporting. We do the same thing with flossing. right? We, we, we report to floss all the time when we go to the dentist. But the truth of the matter is if we did floss as much as we say, we do, then the category would be far bigger than it is. And there's no more representative uh, illustration of this than the past election that we just had. The poll said one thing, oh yeah, I'm going to vote this way, and oh yeah, I'm going to vote that way. The reality showed something different because we're liars. Not very not, 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 not bad people. The idea here is not that the, it's not about intentionality. We're just not that good at it. And the literature continues to show us this. That the evidence reviewed is consistent with the most pessimistic view concerning people's ability to report accurately about their cognitive processes. Maybe quite misleading for social scientists to ask their subjects to what influences their evaluations, their choices, their behaviors. That's the first reason why self-report data isn't so great. The second reason is that People are really bad at making predictions. If we're asking people to self-report on what they might do, they're really bad at doing that, right? Case in point, when the light bulb came to, to, to market, right, really smart folks said, oh, this is going to be a conspicuous failure. The light bulb. Same thing happened with the telephone. Right? Brits like uh, maybe Americans will need it, but us, we got messenger boys. Who needs this thing? The telephone. Military generals said, hey, airplanes are good toys, but they have no military value. Airplanes. And these are smart people here. Even the computer. There's no reason anyone would want this in their home. This is... he. he he is the chairman and founder of the Digital Equipment Corporation. How could they miss this? We're not really good at making predictions, even the experts. Absolute Vodka. When Absolute Vodka came to, to the market, came to the United States, the brand said, people don't even know, Americans don't even know where Sweden is on the map, let alone one of Swedish vodka. What? This is Absolute Vodka here. Even more comically, Red Bull. People are like, it's disgusting during a taste test, during a focus group. Red Bull. We're not good at making predictions. Not only are we liars, we're not good at making predictions. Furthermore, people don't know what they want. They just don't know what they want. Hey, you know this. You ask consumers what they might want. They say, make it cheaper. Give me more of it. Right? It's very much focused on the value proposition. It doesn't get at what they really need. Because they don't really know what they really want. And there's a, a great quote from Henry Ford that Steve Jobs references here. He, Henry Ford said it once that if I asked consumers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why we never rely on market research. I used to work at Apple, and that's very, it's very true. 
we kept saying that, look, our job isn't to, to ask people what they want. It's to read what's on the page before it's even written to understand because asking people to self-report doesn't lead to success. Google in their early days asked consumers, how many page results do you want? How many results do you want on, on, on a page when you do your search? And people said, give us more. Like who doesn't want more? Give me that. I want more. And Google did that, which equated to like my milliseconds add it to the search, the search result queries. And people were like, hey, there's more stuff here, but the stuff at the bottom isn't relevant. And it's like, well, do you know how search works? Like, that's just kind of how it works. We don't know what we want. So I don't know we liars. We're really bad at making predictions. We also don't know what we want. Right? The other part here is that we oftentimes poorly designed the research. And we, we don't do a great job of designing research. And you've probably seen these before, right? You know, you see the, these surveys. Like, how likely are you to purchase a, a, a product? Some big appliance. And they give you a few time windows. One to three months, maybe a half a year, maybe a year, maybe a year or two, or maybe even more than two years. Those are your options. But in reality, you're like, well, I don't know. Maybe when something breaks, something cool comes out. Like maybe I get a raise or a bonus. Maybe it's Christmas. I really don't know. But because the research only gives me those options on the left, you don't get at truth. This is the folly of self-reported data. It just comes up short. Sure, but we rely on it a lot. Fortunately for us, there's another form of data. There is empirical data. Well, what's empirical data? Empirical data is what we observe. It's the information that's received by our observation and documentation of a particular phenomenon. And it's far different than self-reported data. For instance, um, take a, one of my favorite, favorite research that was done they asked some people about their hand washing hygiene. And he said, when you go to the restroom, how often are you to wash your hands? And people said, well, a lot, of course, really like a monster, of course I wash my hands. And it's all done by phone, by phone panel. Excuse me, sir, uh, how often do you wash your hands? A, a lot, all the time. What are you talking about when I go to the restroom? This is all pre-COVID, of course. The researchers in their, in their savviness said, well, Let's actually observe some people and see how true this is. So they went to high traffic, uh, high traffic um, airports and watch people, not go to the bathroom, but watch people wash their hands or if they wash their hands or not after going to the restroom. And what they found was, was mind boggling. Probably not to many of you seeing this, that people lied. Right? Everyone said they washed their hands, but when you watch people in action, they don't do those things. And that's the, that's the folly here, right? And we can learn a lot just by observing people. We can learn so much just by observing people. I think uh, 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 Yogi Berra put it that way. Just by observing people, we can learn a whole heck of a lot. This is the folly of self-reported data. Right, moving beyond what people self-report to getting to how they behave, looking at their behavior, empirical data. Kenny, if you would, can we switch over to the to the other set of slides? I see we're at the end of this one. So while while while, while that's happening there, there we go. There we go. So Yogi Bear told us best, right? Like we can we can learn a lot just by observing people, like just by observing people, who they are, and ultimately what, what they do, right? Oh, are you, go to the other set. Sorry, the set before this one. You jumped the gun on me, Kenny. There we go. Awesome, right? We observe people just by watching what they do. I mean, case in point here, Netflix, right? Netflix said everyone's instinct was if you have age and gender data, pff, you're killing it. You're crushing it. You have that data, you are winning. But what Netflix found is that 
actually it's not it's kind of useless it's not about those superficial senses of who people are their dem- demographic makeup it's watching people right it's not even what they tell you it's about observing what they do and that's superman powerful considering all the data that's made available to us as marketers this this the digital landscape that we live in there's tons of data that's shed reams and reams and reams of data that's shed our job as marketers is to observe that data we can learn a lot just by observing people and as we observe people the idea is to understand me. We observe people as they behave, and from there we understand me. Right? I mean, this is what insights are. Right? We talk about what are the insights? And we oftentimes mistake observations for insights. I watch people do a thing, and that's an insight. No, it's not. It's an observation. An insight is making meaning of what we have observed. And when it comes to observing people and society and culture at large, we're looking at one thing standing in for something else. We're observing a behavior that's standing in for meaning. People are doing a thing, but why are they doing it? Because of some ideological guide that governs their behavior. One philosopher by the name of Snoop Dogg said it this way. I keep a blue flag hanging on my backside, only on the left side. Yeah, that's the crip side. If you don't know the meaning behind that artifact that he wears in his jeans, then you see that behavior. You go, oh, he must have a runny nose, or he's just he is just uh, accentuating his his outfit. But it, that blue flag means membership into this community. So how do we do that? How do we observe people? Well, we rely on ethnographic research, right? It's this qualitative method by which we observe people by immersing ourselves in their natural environment, in their cultural context. We go native. And there are many ways for us to do this, right? There's the more analog way, this where we go if we want to learn about uh, if we learn about cosplayers, then we go to Comic Con. We hang out with cosplayers to understand who they are, what they believe, what they do. Maybe we do photos where we give someone a camera or we use tell someone to take photos over the course of their days, and we take those those photos and we analyze them. What does it mean? Why they take why they capture this as opposed to that? What does it mean? What is it telling us? Then, of course, there's digital ethnographies, what Rob Cosnett phrases as netnographies, which is my, my, my research methodology of choice. We observe people in their zeros and ones environments where they're interacting with other people in these zeros and ones environments to better understand who they are and what they do by observing them. Ultimately, the job here is to better understand people, understand who these people are and how they make meaning so that the observations that we see, the phenomenon that we observe is made meaningful. We're able to extract insights that we are so horribly anemic as an industry because as we, as people behave, as they app, as they move, as they go, they shed data for us. And as a result, in kind, we as marketers, we observe that data, we make meaning of that data, and it informs how we as marketers behave. It informs how we show up in the world. And fortunately for us, that, that data comes in the form of a lot of different means. From search to eye tracking to geographic location, right? Uh, things that people like, what they talk about, their steps, they, what they watch, all these many ways that we can observe them. Frank Moss puts it this way every time we perform a search, a tweet, and send an email, post a blog, comment on one, use a cell phone, go this way, even when we don't move, our phones are passively shedding data. And each one of these data points, each one of these little breadcrumbs of data creates opportunity for us to 
better understand meaning. And we don't get that. We don't get that through self-reported data. We get that through observations, empirical data. And that is super, man, powerful, unbelievably powerful. But of course, there's a catch. There's always a catch. There's a catch. Here's the catch. That good data alone won't guarantee good results. Good data, good empirical, observative data. It's not enough. We need more than just good data. We need more than just the good empirical data. We need theory. Which is my second point. We need theory. Now, here's the thing. I know we, we're in a room full of marketers, even in a zeros and ones virtual room full of marketers, full of practitioners. When we hear the word theory, we go, oh, please don't. I don't want to hear it. Theory? Oh, get out of here. Ugh. Now, we don't say it that way. Instead, we say it, that works in theory, but that works in theory, but yeah, I hear you. That works in theory, but reality. And every time I hear this, every time I hear it, it makes my blood boil just a little bit. Because I always ask myself, I mean, I ask myself as I'm asking them, but I say in my head, do you even know what theory is? Like, do you know what theory is? Theory is the principle by which all action is informed. Every time we make a decision, everything we do is informed by some theoretical representation of reality. The challenge is that we don't have the best theory. We don't have good causality-based theory. But theory in and of itself Theory helps us understand meaning. It's how we make sense of the world. We go, oh, that's happening because of X, Y, and Z. That X, Y, and Z, that dot, 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 that's theory, friends. We use theory all the time. And this is the thing. We have access to tons of data. In fact, we actually have access to all the same data, right? We all have very similar data stacks. Right, and those data stacks are pulling from the same APIs, the same data sources. We have access to all the same information. What differentiates us as marketers, as practitioners, is our ability to make meaning, to understand meaning that exists in what we observe. And I tell you, it's a big white space here. <laughs> Why? Because we got tons of data. And as practitioners, we're not doing a great job of making meaning, of understanding meaning. So what does that mean for us then? What does that mean, Marcus? We got to get a better repertoire of theory. Right? We'll say things that like, oh, people share that because it's funny. It's like, well, there are a ton of things I don't share that I think is funny. right? Like I grew up watching Eddie Murphy and I love Sarah Silverman and Dave Chappelle and, and I love South Park and Family Guy, but I never share those things on Facebook. Never. Why? Because my mama's on Facebook. Right? My, 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 my congregation from church is on Facebook. I'm not sharing that. Are you kidding me? It'll make me look bad. We share things not because of its tonality. We share things because of the currency that it provides us, the social currency that it provides us, that helps us to connect together. But we'll say people share it because it's funny. They share it because it was funny. The tonality made it share worthy. It's not the case. But the only way we get there, the only way we get there, my friends, is to increase our repertoire of theory. That means we got to start studying the social sciences, right? We got to study, start studying the social sciences. The folks who rigorously investigate these things the folks who spend their time, to spend their lives dedicated to understanding these things, the behavioral sciences, right? I'm talking anthropology, sociology, psychology, behavioral economics, network theory, right? These, this is the study of man, of people. And our job as marketers is to get people to take action. 
So we got to understand people. Now, can we go to the last set of slides here? We got to understand people. We've got to be myopically focused on understanding people. And theory helps provide a clearer windshield for us to better understand people. Theory clears the way like a windshield wiper does to help us better understand theory, to better understand people. And here's probably the biggest issue for us as a community of practitioners. As W.E.D. Du Bois puts it, herein lies the tragedy age. Not that men are poor, because all men know something about poverty. Not that men are wicked, because who is good? Not that men are ignorant, because what is truth? Nay. But men know so little of men. We don't know people. And it's because of this that the marketing is unpredictable. It's because of this that we find ourselves out of sync with understanding our people. Because we look at people as consumers who eat messages and crap cash. Not the case. Look out the window, you don't see consumers, you see people. So we have to get better at understanding people. Look, the best marketers on the planet, at least the best market researchers on the planet, they're comedians. Why? They just watch people. They just watch people and go, oh, that was interesting. You see what she just did there? Oh, and he did it too. Oh, oh, and they did. Okay, okay, this is a thing. Something's happening here. And they observe the phenomenon, empirically observe the phenomenon. And then they start applying theory to what they observe to describe what's happening. What's going on here? They use theory to describe what's happening between this phenomenon that's happening among people. And they think of an interesting way to communicate and they get on stage to say, hey, you guys notice every time you go to the mall, you do X, Y, and Z. We all go, oh, it's so me. I totally do that. Well, of course you do. Because they know people. Which means for us as marketers, with tons of data at our disposal, we have to shift from a mindset of certainty to a mindset of curiosity. Data provides some sense of certainty, but it doesn't really. Good data is an observation of reality. What we do as marketers is make meaning of that data. What does it mean? That's what insight is all about. And to get there, it requires good historical evidence, good data, and some causality-based theory. When we put these things together, it increases the likelihood of a particular outcome. Which, of course, begs the question then, Marcus, so, so well, well, what's the problem here? Why is it that markers are still struggling to understand their consumers? I'll tell you. It's because we mistake information for intimacy. We think because I have information about you that I know you. And those two things are not analogous. Because I have information about you that I know you. No, sir. Not true. You all have meetings with clients and you scour and you become sleuths looking at, uh, looking at LinkedIn to figure out who these people are. And you get on the meeting. You start talking to them and you get to know them. Despite all the information you have, those things are only a shell of representing who people are. Intimacy is what's required to understand people. This should shape or at least provide a new perspective for us to see the world, a new aperture for us to see the world. Understanding people. Which leads to the third thing. So we know that not all data are created equal. We know there's a need for theory, but here's the third, the last, and arguably the most important. There's a need for humanity. There's a need for humanity. While we have good data, good historical evidence, and we have good causality-based theory, we have to apply humanity to it. That is, we have to be thinking like people. 
you know, we, uh, we, we go to, to the office as marketers, as practitioners, and we put our marketing hat on. I'm a marketer. Let's sell some widgets. And we take our human hat off at the door. We don't think like humans in the building. And it's the funniest thing to me, right? It's like, yo, you know, Bruce Wayne and Batman are the same people. They just have a different outfit on, right? The same thing goes here. We have to practice some humanity because we also are human. Said differently, we've got to be more empathetic. We need some empathy. Empathy. Now, empathy, is a, empathy is a difficult one, right? We, we, we often find ourselves having a hard time defining empathy. Like we know it, but like you have someone to define it, it gets a little tricky. I like the way my friend Michael Ventura defines empathy. He says empathy is self-aware perspective taking to gain richer understanding. Self-aware, purposeful, perspective taking, take on someone else's perspective to gain a richer understanding. And one of the reasons why empathy is so hard to define because empathy is not one thing. It actually consists of three different forms of empathy. The first form of empathy is known as semantic empathy. And this is actually quite automatic, right? It just kind of happens automatically. We're wired for this. We, it's like we mirror each other's feelings, right? Unless you're a sociopath, you have the, the, this part of you, this psychological part of you that mirrors what we see other people do, right? For instance, uh, say Kenny slams his hand in the door. I go, ooh, man, you all right? Ooh, dude, I felt that. You okay? You good? Ooh, it hurt me to see that, right? That's semantic empathy. The part of the brain called the mirror neuron system that mirrors what it sees. So when I see, when I see Kenny experience pain, I go, ooh, you good, man? You good? That's why laughing is so contagious. Yawning is so contagious. Right? My wife watches uh, the, the notebook. She just sobs and cries. Because in her mind, she's mirroring what it might feel like to be loved by Ryan Gosling. And that's cool. It, they start The movie came out before we started dating, so it's all good. But that's one form of empathy. The other form of empathy, we have a little bit more agency. And that's affective empathy. And it's summed up in the notion, what would I do if this were me? And we know this. This should sound pretty familiar, right? This is like the golden rule. Do unto others as you want done unto you. In almost every culture, almost every religion on the planet, there's some semblance, some articulation of the golden rule. Do unto others as you want done unto you. So Kenny's having a bad day. I'm like, man, Kenny's my boy. I'll make sure he's all right. Let me, you know, just check in on Kenny. Kenny, you good? And I send him a text message. I call him. Just checking in on you. Make sure you're good throughout the day. And I'm like, because I'm a good friend. That's what I do. Because I'm a good friend. I'm going to check in on my boy. Kenny, you good? Everybody good? Sweet. Bet. This is affective empathy. I would want someone to do that for me if I was having a bad day. So I do that for him. But here's the third empathy. The third form of empathy. and it's a little bit more complicated. It's cognitive empathy. It's sort of a twist on the, the golden rule. The golden rule is do unto others as you want done unto you. Cognitive empathy is do unto others as they want done unto them. A twist. See, when I'm having a bad day, I want my friends to call me, check in on me, see how I'm doing. Right? I want people to send me text messages like, you good, Marcus, checking in, send me funny gifts. Like, I, I want that. But Kenny may be the kind of person that, when you're having a bad day, leave me alone. Kenny may be like, look, man, I'm having a bad day. Get away from me. But I'm sending Kenny text messages. I'm sending him emails. I'm checking in on him. And Kenny's like, will this guy stop hounding me? Stop. And as I'm emailing him, and he's not emailing me back, or he emails in a passive-aggressive way in return, I go, what's wrong with this guy? Does he understand what kind of friend he has in me? Look how empathetic I am. That's not cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy requires me understanding what Kenny needs. It's me understanding how Kenny needs support when he's not feeling well, when he's not good. It requires me taking off my perspective and adopting his. 
I may want this, but he doesn't need that right now. So what does he need? It requires denying ourselves, which is a really hard thing to do. Right? I'm a father of uh, two girls named Georgia and Ivy. Ivy's the youngest. Georgia's the, the eldest. And when Georgia does something to hurt my feelings, I never say to her, how would you feel if I did that to you? Because that's forcing her to be effectively cognitive, effectively empathetic, rather. Instead, I say to her, how would you feel? How do you think that makes daddy feel? How do you think that makes me feel? Which forces her to deny her own perspective and adopt mine. It's a skill that's difficult, but necessary. I mean, we often talk about, you know, we use the analogy, uh, the, the, the adage, the maxim when we talk about empathy as walk a mile in someone's shoes, walk a mile in someone's shoes, feel their pain, walk a mile in someone's shoes. And that's helpful. That's good. And I'm not going to at all. It's well-spirited, but it's not enough. It's not enough to walk a mile in someone's shoes. We have to see the world through their lenses. I have to see the world through their eyes and understand how they make meaning, how they see the world. Right? I could, I could walk a mile in your shoes and be like, you complain about this? I mean, yeah, it's difficult and yeah, it's time consuming, but, 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 but. Eh, yeah, it's kind of hard, but come on, you can man up and make this happen. I experience your experience through my own meaning-making lenses. We're talking about being cognitively empathetic. I experience the way you, you experience the world, but I see it through your eyes. And I tell you, the data we have, it, it's a representation of reality, of what is. But the meaning of what is requires great intimacy. It requires an unbelievable amount, radical, radical, radical empathy if we are to do that well. And I tell you folks, all the data in the world we have, this will never be a thing. No one's life will never be surmised by the amount of data that they shed about themselves. No, not. Life is meaningful. But we have to understand we have to get close to, we have to be empathetic with people to understand meaning. This is why my entire practice sits right inside of three things, three converging things. Understand the evolving media landscape, the data that we use sheds, the data that we use sheds information about who we are and, and what matters to or who we are and what we do. And then there's the behavioral sciences. This is the underlying physics of why we do what we do. And then lastly, it's understanding cultural proximity. And the convergence of those three things helps us better understand people. Fortunately enough, this is what I study. This is what I research as an academic. I'm a professor at the Ross School of Business, University of Michigan. My research is in cultural contagion and meaning making. That's what I study. But as a practitioner, I'm the chief strategy officer, a head of planning at Wine Kennedy in New York. This is what I do as a practitioner as well. So I get to put ideas in the world as an advertiser and put people in the world as an academic. And the hope in all this is to bridge the academic practitioner gap. Right? Take these things that we rigorously study as academics and apply them to the pragmatism of application. And all of this begs the question. Knowing this now, what are you going to do? That's old Kanye, by the way. What are you going to do? You have tons of data at your disposal. You actually have good empirical data. This is a digital conference, after all, at your disposal. But we need theory to make meaning of that data. And once we've made meaning of it, we have to be radically empathetic if we are to apply it. And this is the challenge with marketers. One person puts it this way, we oftentimes use data the way a drunk uses a lamppost, not for illumination, which the lamppost is supposed to be for. We use it for support, like a drunk uses it. And we've got to be better than that. I hope this is helpful. 
At the very least, I hope this forces you to see the world just a little bit differently. Because it's the way we see the world that ultimately informs the way that we behave in the world. And we have a better way of seeing the world that we show up in the world in a much better way as well. Thank you so very much. Um, this is a pleasure. If you have questions, uh, you, we can reach me here. It's my Twitter handle at Mark to the C. It's also my Instagram handle. Or you go to my website, uh, Mark to the C.com, and you can send me a note. We'd love to hear from you, answer any questions we have for you, any provocations, any pushback. I'll, I'll take it all. Uh, but I'm so grateful to be here with you all. Kenneth, I'm going to call him Kenny by his last name. Kenneth, uh, thank you so much for having me, Doc. Why don't you come join us? Oh, Kenneth's calling me. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I'm not certain why you can't. Well, you can hear me. I can now. You're just fine. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I thought, I thought you were still on the audio issues. Yeah, I had to text you while you were calling me, uh, Kenny. So fantastic. You know, the thing is, I heard someone call you Kenny before. I was like, oh, I guess Kenny goes by Kenny. I didn't know that. I thought we were friends. Child. That's why my <laughs> nickname is Shark, and it's easier for everybody to remember. <laughs> so, Marcus. Um, yes, sir. I, I, I want to talk to you about um, something that I think is kind of timely as well uh, because of, of a Netflix documentary, uh, Nazi Spiracy. That's one that, that gets me excited. But the one about bias, how do we as marketers, and I'm, and I'm asking an African-American gentleman this question as well, and it's something that, you know, there are different ways to look at ones and zeros. There just yeah. are. And, that, and I think bias today with so much data has to be at least discussed for people to think about because we come in, whatever your background is, with some perspective of the way we look at data when we apply it to actual people. So Amen. to again, to humanize it, 100% with you, but sometimes that can, even when we don't know it, you know, without ill intent or anything like that, how do we, we look at data smartly without injecting too much bias? I mean, honestly, anytime you look at data as a human, you're going to inject some bias, but well, yeah. pulling back as much as we can uh, becomes difficult. So how, what's your advice on, on especially telling your students or other marketers how to do that? Well, I mean, first of all, you're spot on. I couldn't agree with you more. It's spot on. You're right. Like there's bias. We are biased, right? We have implicit bias. We have cultural bias. We have human bias. There are just heuristics that end up shading uh, the hues of what we observe. My, my recommendation is always this. And, and by the way, you can't get rid of that. Like that just exists in all of us. My recommendation is always to ask why three times. So when someone, you observe something, people go, what has happened there? Our first response is usually at the top of our bias. Ah, oh, those people do this. Or, ah, oh, you know, those millennials, right? Like we, we go with like the bias is the first thing that drives us. But then we go, well, well, why do think it's the millennials? Oh, well, because then we go one step deeper. Well, why do you think that? Then we go one step deeper and we either say, oh, wow, I don't know. Maybe it's just a bias that I have. Or we go, well, Maybe we should look into that a little bit more. The idea of asking why um, essentially helps us get at intentionality, get at, get at the root cause of how we're making meaning or interpreting what we see. And when we ask ourselves why three times, it forces us to face our biases. In the best situations, it allows us to mitigate them. Yeah, and I, the reason I ask this question in particular also is because I worked for a big data company, one of the most well-known and respected. And then I went to work for a brand a well-respected brand, uh, but I remember having the conversations on the brand side where somebody would ask me about targeting different personas. And mm -hmm. again, the moment you do that, uh, it's not necessarily a statement of whether or not it's to the point, your point about millennials, millennials in particular are one of those DIY segments for a lot of, you know, a lot of home services brand. That's where yeah. they sort of box anybody young in. And then we inject, uh, our, we target our campaigns, if you will, towards those groups. And most of the time that's done off thinking that your data is correct. But that's right. the lens that you create that data from can be completely wrong. So when you work in big data, you, you start seeing a million points of light that gives you a more agnostic feel to the data. But when you go to the brand side, you automatically see the, that they're trying to target this group or that group, and it becomes some narrowed down persona, a stereotype, if you will. Yep. And it makes sense from some somewhat of a targeting standpoint. 
but that's under the assumption that your data that you build that around is correct as well. That's that's not always the case. That's right. I mean, it, it, you're, you're spot on. And, and here's the thing that the best we can do is mitigate some of the biases we have. And th those heuristics exist. I mean, take what we do on the academic side. I mean, like we are really rigorous on the academic side, right? Like, you know, we spend years researching one specific thing using the centuries of, of literature that, that describes a phenomenon, mounds of data to try to get at some generalizability of what we're observing, right? Some you know, big sample population, get a big sample of the population and try to make meaning of it. And even there, those things are limited, right? They, they, they exist. The idea is how do we make it more rigorous? So as I'm a qualitative researcher by training, I do most of my, my research very qualitatively. I think I'll have other people code the data so that it's not just my perspective looking at it, it's someone else's. Because to your point, the data itself is valueless. Data have value. It just is. It's, it's a statistical observation, especially zeros and ones, statistical observation of what has happened, an event that's taken place. What we do as practitioners, you on both sides, as a, on the, the, at an agency side, advertising agency side, to a, a brand side, to a dig, digital agency side, like you're making meaning of it. It's you that brings value to it, which is why we as marketers have to be better. Like, I mean, like the, the data is the data. Data doesn't change. It's what we as the instrument, the research instrument, how tight and pristine per, per we are and being able to make meaning of it. So we have to like, we got to go to the gym. <laughs> we got to do new reps. You know, we got to get our repertoire uh, more, more robust and more diverse if we are to look at the world more diversely. So uh, in one point of bias that I neglected is I didn't call you doctor. Because yeah, I, it's, we're even. I, I, so we're even. You call me Kenny and I called you. I forgot <laughs> I neglected because having worked with about 50 colleges, universities, we started naming ourselves everybody as a doctor because it just became so used to it. I've gotten out of that. Are you noticing uh, that students are coming in with a bias? Uh, sorry, not bias is not the right word. Are they coming in with a different perspective today than what you necessarily expect when you look at where you're applying that same knowledge at Wyden Kennedy? Uh, the, are the marketers of tomorrow Farther along, lesser along, more biased one way. They think they know more. Let's let's pick on the the uh, Gen Zs. Yeah, I, so I would <laughs> I would say that because they have more data than I. Well, right. So the, I, yeah, I think that that's that's the that's the difference is that they the the lexicon the jargon that we use in the business it's far more it's a part of our normal lexicon, right? Like. My mom is 83 years old and she'll say that like, I'm not in the demographic. <laughs> so what are you talking about, mom? Like, she's like, what are you talking about? Like, she knows that language. Like, we talk about ourselves as brands. Like, we, we refer to ourselves, like, I gotta do it for my brand. It's not a good look for my brand. These, the language that we use in our business is, it's so much a part of like normal vernacular that I think students walk in with a better repository of how to talk about marketing. So it's not like, you know, a, a, a empty canvas. However, which I think actually you're implying is that it also comes with some baggage, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, I know this stuff already. It's like, well, actually you don't, right? And I'll hear someone say, well, I grew up on the internet. So I know, blah, 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 blah. and I'm like, well, I grew up pre-internet. So yeah. you know more than me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what are we talking about here? In fact, I would argue that when I was really active, when I first really got active on social networking platforms, I was actually pasting and creating code on MySpace and Black Planet. Like you're just creating content. You're just uploading content. I was doing both. So who's the more savvy? Like it, it, the idea here is that, you know, we take on these sort of monikers that we're given. We're, we, we, we embody the boxes that we're put in. And we go, because I'm a millennial. Duh, 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 duh. It's like, well, stop for a moment there. Now, what I will say, though, is that because they come in more knowledgeable of the concepts, even at a macro level, they're more knowledgeable or have a better command of the language. We're not teaching language so much as we used to, which actually kind of 
allows us to be a little, uh, take some steps further, right? Go a little bit deeper in the, the concepts. My hope, my prayer, inshallah, you know, as a as a, an academic that I help, you know, have a, a fingerprint on what will be the future of our of our discipline uh, yeah. for the markers tomorrow. Well, uh, you know what? I've been talking this whole time without my microphone. You, you, you sound great now. You sure. sound great. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, one of the things I think, though, that, I, that I'm always interested in, though, as we progress, and we started off the very first session yesterday with having someone talk about data privacy, which you did eloquently well uh, throughout. But it's also to the point where I'm wondering how much that next generation is going to help uh, push or get frustrated once they go to the big corporations that are doing all the things you're talking about that you don't want them to do. I mean, yeah. we, we think about this through the lens of our phone all the time and what data we give away. And it's 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 catnip for, uh, you know, something like The Great Hack or, or one of those yeah. shows on Netflix. Right, but at right, the same right. time, then they go work. Uh, you know, in some sort of architect role or something like that. And uh, they're part of part of the system that that we're still just giving away so much data and information. It's crazy. That's right. I mean, it, th that's the challenge. I mean, and data privacy, it's it's such it's such a hairy thing. It's really challenging. Um, and I guess the way I sit on it is that like. As people, citizens of this world. When we're giving up data, sometimes unknowingly, we have a right to agency of what's ours, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, transparency is super important. And if as marketers, we see that, we go, you're taking away everything that we, that we can do. You're limiting blah, 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 blah. I can't help but ask, how good are you as a marketer then? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like if the only way that we do what we do well is through opacity, then there's the big issue is us. And the hope is that as these conversations, this discourse is happening today, that future walk in with some understanding of that discourse and they go in and start questioning what we perceive as this is just what we do around here. And the yeah. hope in all that is that uh, this is what change requires, requires dissent. Well, and I and I think the lens that I often look through this, and I think I may have told you this before, but I swim with sharks. I'm actually doing this this weekend. So I'm not a, uh, I'm going to say Greenpeace type of conservationist, but I, I really pay respect to the waters. There's not a group, though, similar to that, not necessarily a Greenpeace, but there's not a group similar to that at, with that we see with people. There's not that kind of movement to protect data. We're yeah. We're so relying right now on Apple to politely turn off cookies, right? but then we're going to miss it from an ad targeting and measurement standpoint. So it's, it's just very funny, the world that we're living in. And the only lens that we really look at it is when an election doesn't go our way. And then we start screaming about it every two to four years. So, right. uh, but anyway, fantastic presentation, Marcus, really enjoyed having you here. Thank um, you so much, and, Kenneth. And, yeah, I'm you're welcome. Dr. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Listen, buddy, have a great, Great week, and uh, we'll get in, we'll get in touch soon. I need to get you on the podcast as well. Indeed, enjoy the sharks. Be safe out there. <laughs>